There's a big secret in our gay community, and no one is talking about it. Well, today we are. Welcome to No Two Gays About It, the show for the over-50 gay male, all about things that are important to the over-50 gay male, and hosted by two well-over-50 gay men. Hi, I'm Tom Burke. And I'm Michael Foley. And today we are going to talk about the secret within our gay community that no one is talking about. Addiction. First of all, we're going to take a look at the different types of addiction that are affecting our over-50 gay population. And then we're going to discuss why this is such a problem, especially for us mature gay men. And finally, we're going to ask and try to answer the question, at our age, can we move beyond this secret or is it just too late? This is a widespread problem within our gay community, and if you think that it's not affecting you or the people within your circle, well, then you better look a little deeper, because it's there. Join us for the conversation as we take on this big gay secret of addiction. Before we dive into this conversation, guys, please click like and subscribe. And if you don't want to miss a video or anything new that comes out from us, ring that little bell in the bottom of your screen. All right. It's time to break the silence and talk about addiction. But before we do, I just want to say that Michael and I are not therapists, we are not doctors, we are not experts on this or any subject out there, but as members of this over 50 gay community, we do feel that it's important that we at least start the conversation and just bring it out to the open and talk about the things that most people don't want to talk about. So, Michael, let's get into this whole addiction thing. Yeah, because it's a big one. It is. It Addiction is running rampant within our gay community. And I just want to read one statistic that I found. Uh, statistics show that the older gay males are more than twice as likely as their heterosexual counterpoints to use illicit drugs and almost twice as likely to suffer from a substance use disorder. What the heck? It's mind-boggling, isn't it? Yeah. That's a lot of people out there. And yeah. not only is it a lot of people, but there are a lot of different forms of addiction that men like us are finding themselves in. Right. Biggest one, which I'm sure you have first-hand um, knowledge of yeah. after working in a bar, gay bar, for how many years? 20-something? We don't talk about that Okay. <laughs> it was a very long time. All right. Yeah. But the addiction to alcohol. Alcohol. Yeah. It's a, it's it's a big one. And it I, is. I, you know, I think a lot of us just use it as a way to relax and feel comfortable in a situation. Well, uh, yes. That's how the normal people use it, but there are people who are addicted to it. There are alcoholics out there. There are people who are abusing alcohol. We all see it. Um, and the thing is about all of these addictions that it doesn't really matter your station in life, where you are, your age. It affects everybody. Um, not only alcohol, but it, another thing that is really huge in our community is the addiction to drugs. Without a doubt, yeah. Crystal meth is a, is a huge one in our community right now, as it is across the country. Um, yeah. I just watched a whole documentary on crystal meth and the gay community. It's affecting more the younger gay men as opposed to the older gay men that we're talking about. However, it is still happening within that you know age range. But there's also cocaine and... Uh, Ecstasy and ecstasy, uh, yeah, yeah it, huge, right? Uh, any sort of stimulant or any sort of downer, all of those. What about pot? Now it, that you it know, is, I, it, it, pot to me has become the new alcohol. Um, yeah, because it is it is addictive, and you know, alcohol is this accepted evil. In our society, it, it's it's a part of who we are socially on so many right. different levels, and so it's a very easy addiction to overlook. And I think marijuana is becoming that because uh, it, it, you know it's become legal here in California. There are dispensaries right. every five feet, so you know being high is being high. It doesn't matter what brings you that relief of whatever it is in your life that you're feeling stress from or you're not happy with, 
um, it's just, it's the same across the board, whether it's food, whether it's sex. Um, if if it's, well, you're using it as an escape, it, it gets well, a little sketchy. Right. So let's talk about that. Besides alcohol and drugs, which are pretty much what people think like, oh, the addictions, drugs and alcohol. But no, you mentioned too, more, sex is a huge addiction within our gay community, especially the older gay uh, males. For whatever reason, it's affecting them. Food, humongous for not only the gay community, but everybody out there, people who are addicted to food, who are using it for, yeah. you know, reasons. You know, um, the, tough thing, the tough thing with food is you actually do need that to survive. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's right. one of those things. It's not like alcohol or any of the other addictions where you could avoid it. You don't have to go to a bar. You know, you don't have liquor in your house. But food, you need to survive. So that's, right. that's a really tough one. And even the opposite of ingesting tons of food, exercising. People are addicted to exercise. I'm sure you see this out there, a lot of gay men. I was at the gym this morning, and there are some guys that, it's like, buddy, have a cheeseburger and stop lifting. You know, like, yeah. they, they too, uh, the whole addiction to their body image. Um, yeah, I, I, I know people who will actually go to the gym two to three times a day. Okay. For an hour and a half to two hours each session. Wow. And, um, you know, it's great. You know, you're, you, it, it helps you physically, but on a deeper level, you have to ask, well, what is it you're avoiding in your life, right? Right. Because that's a lot of time. It's a lot of time. Um, but people are spending a lot of time on whatever their addiction is, whether it's drinking or drugs or food or sex or, you know, they're spending a lot of time with this addiction because- And it I'm going to add two to the list, um, social okay. media and television. Okay. I definitely see that social media thing, yeah. the people who cannot put their phones down. Yeah. It's like, wow. That really? if it's down for five minutes, you feel like you're disconnected from- Yeah. You know, um, which is crazy for men our age and especially older men. We weren't raised this way. We didn't have this until, you know, basically a few years ago. So the fact that they are becoming addicted at our age, it's like, really, you can't put that down? Mm, okay. You know, addiction is addiction is that little evil thing that hides in the closet. And it's, it's, it's always sitting there. And, you know, depending on what's going on in your life, you're always going to seek something out that helps you escape or just feel better for a short period of time. Because right. let's be real, life is hard. And it seems to be getting harder <laughs> every day, um, especially as we get older, because there are so many other factors involved, our health, um, you know, how we feel on a daily basis. Another thing that I read, I'm going to read to you guys, uh, gay seniors over the age of 57 um, with issues like depression, stress, anxiety, ADHD, PTSD, are in a higher risk category for an addiction. Also, get this one, Caucasians are in a higher risk for an addiction, um, uh, whatever, and also people with high IQs. So the thing is that it's really affecting everybody, but now let's figure out why. Why is this happening to us? I can speak for myself um, okay. because I've had a lot of struggles with addiction throughout the course of my life. Um, when I was younger, um, probably through my 20s, I would definitely have considered myself an alcoholic. Um, and I, I look at that and I know the reasons why now, um, because I had some life situations that forced me to look at it. And that was because feelings of self-worth were involved or self-worthlessness, I should say. Um, right how I valued myself, how I thought about myself. Um, it was definitely an escape for me. It made me feel better for a period of time that everything else went away. And right. in those moments where I was drinking and partying, it was happy. And then you have to wake up the next day with the hangover and go back to your life. And um, there was a lot of unhappiness and misery with me. And... Um, I, you know, it, it's, it stems from my family's history. My mother and father were alcoholics. My mother was a drug addict. She actually was arrested at the age of 70 for um, heroin oh use. Oh, my. Yeah, right? For heroin use. 
and possession because one of the people she was shooting up with OD'd and died. So they had to call the paramedics. So they were arrested. I mean, that's how deep it runs in in, in my family. Um, And fortunately, I was able to move past that in my 20s. Well, I think you just gave us two really important reasons why people fall to addiction. One of them is it's in our DNA. It's in our genes. You know, it is a trait that it gets handed down. Um, It's proven. I've read it. If I read it, it's it's right. Uh, But we have seen that, that addiction is just handed down from generation to generation. Um, It's up to you how you deal with it. Like you, you took got control of it. I'm really sorry about your mom, though, you know. No, thank you, but, you know, to th- be, those are her choices. And uh, Right, right. Yeah. Um, but, you know, to still be, as we're talking about older gay men, you know, as your mom, still fighting the demons uh, at 70, It's that's a tough, long yeah. life, you know. Yeah. But besides it being passed down in our genes, the other thing that you mentioned was the unhappiness. And for so many of us gay men, our wounds are really deep, you know? And if it started as a child with people putting you down for being gay or making fun of you or making you feel the big word that we'll say a lot today, shame, yep. you know, that's why I started doing drugs younger and started drinking and, you know, being able to hide it so people don't actually see that it's happening. But or those, you surround yourself with other people who are yeah. doing the exact same thing, so you get reinforcement to continue right. the addiction. And to me, that's, that's, that's a really sort of bad circle to be caught up in, because, you know, I, have, I still know people who, who drink daily, excessively, yeah. and if you're around them, they want you to drink too because it makes them feel better. And it always fascinates me when I'm drinking a bottle of water and people are like, oh, you're not drinking? And I'm like, well, you do realize that's how it's supposed to be, right? That what you're doing is the one where I should be going, oh, you're drinking? But I don't because right. I know the stuff that lies underneath, but it is always amazing how people who are partying want you to join them, right? Have you been in those social situations? Oh, yeah, where it's definitely. like, oh, Tom, why aren't you drinking? Have a drink. It's like, why do I have to drink, right? To make you have a better time? My husband doesn't drink. For he just doesn't like it. He never has. It's just not his thing. And I will like occasionally have like a cocktail because I feel really important and cool. But um we were out actually, we went to a dinner party, I don't know, maybe a week ago, and they were serving dessert and it had a liqueur in it or something. And they're like, saying to my husband, like, oh, I'm sorry, we we have something different for you. And he's like, what are you talking about? And they're like, oh, well, you don't drink, so we thought you were in the program. And he's like, no, I just don't like to drink, (laughs) you know? Like, it's such an odd thing in our gay community to have somebody like you, like my husband, who is not going to drink. Um, And I'm sure, again, sorry to bring back up your past, but working in the bars... I'm sure you saw this where those people like glob onto each other. Like, yeah. you know, like we have our gay dar, they have their, you know, alcoholic dar where they like see someone who has the same thing that they do. And so here's someone that I can drink with and not feel bad. Is that something that you would see out in the bars? Oh, without a doubt. Um, yeah. You know, it, it, it's, it is inherent to every bar. You, you have the bar flies, you have the people who are there all the time, because at least it's a space where they feel safe, right? It may not right. be the healthiest environment, but it, it brings momentary relief. And until you're able to figure out what it is you're seeking relief from, unfortunately, you get stuck in the quagmire and you can't get out. Um, so... I think the purpose of this conversation for me with you is to just maybe make somebody go, hmm, Um, because that's the first step in sort of looking within and and figuring out what it is that's hurting or missing or what that what that void is that you're trying to fill. Well, you know, one thing that I also read, because as you know, I love doing research. I love reading things, especially about topics that I'm not all that up on. But this is something that I read. I want to read again to you guys. Um, So many members 
of the gay community suffer from internalized homophobia, projecting the negative social attitudes on themselves. The result is often self loathing and an inability to feel comfortable in one's own skin, which leads to addiction. That is so true, especially guys our age, because we right. we never were taught that we were enough. Yeah. That we always had to hide. And again, we're going to go back to that word, shame. Yeah. Um, and for a lot of us, there is PTSD involved too, because we lived through the 80s, and there was so much pain. And I'm not sure it's anything we'll ever be able to move on from, but we have to acknowledge it. Well, I think that's it. The, the acknowledgement of anything helps. Um, but just the fact that for for men like us and and older who were raised in a time where you know it was okay to be called a fag and to people put you down for being sissies or whatever that is to then especially well also depending on where you were raised you start taking on this as i just read the internalized homophobia where it's like yeah those fags whatever and just making you feel worse and worse yeah. and worse about yourself i mean it's cliche but, you know, most of those bull bullies who were calling us fags and oh, were so yeah. overtly violent, both physically and emotionally, um, were closeted gays. Yeah. That that's, that's how they dealt with their own inner rage, was to throw it at other people. Right. And um, there was, yeah, there's so, there's so much scarring from our generation. There is from every generation, but I think... Ours has some different challenges that uh, other generations fortunately have not had. Well, and it, it's proof is right here in the amount of men our age and older who are f battling addiction. Yeah, you brought up the age of 57, right? That's yeah. sort of right, right in the wheelhouse of the 80s, right? you know? Yeah, crazy. Um, another thing that I, that I read about why our gay community is being affected so much and one of the reasons also is the aging process. Gay men are having a harder time dealing with aging than their counterpoint uh, heterosexuals. Of course, we all see that. We all, you know, and I, we're all having a hard time aging. I mean, nobody yeah. is going through life going like, I love feeling like shit every morning. I love that my face has dropped five more inches today. But a lot of guys can't seem to deal with it. And so they are turning to drugs or alcohol to make them feel better about themselves or sex or food or whatever it, their addiction is. Or whatever predisposition you had to an addiction to begin with is now only compounded because there's another layer on top of it. Right. You know, so it, it does become worse. And yeah. I really am surprised, especially here in um, the desert, how many guys our age do use crystal meth. Really? Like it, it blows my mind. See, that's something that I don't see in the circles that I'm in. Um, so yeah, that's because we all know how destructive that is. Yeah. You know, just, you know, Google it. You see the before and after people's uh, people on meth. It's like, damn, that thing takes over, you know? Yeah. Um, and I mean, anybody who is starting meth knows that on some level, like you do with any addiction, you yeah. know it. But you always think, oh, I could tame this dragon. And the truth is, you can't, especially with crystal meth, because years ago, I saw a documentary on meth use. And there's a point of no return with that drug, because they yeah. showed somebody who was using meth for an extended period of time, uh, a CAT scan of their brain, and then they showed somebody with Alzheimer's. And it truly destroys your frontal lobe, which is your ability to reason to have a conscience, wow. to determine right or wrong, um, those things are gone. So there is a point of no return with that. It's not like other addictions with alcohol where you can sort of mitigate the damage when you do stop or cocaine or stuff like that. Crystal yeah. meth is a whole different animal and it's really scary. I don't know that much about crystal meth. So I question, is it an expensive drug? No, they see that's part of the reason why I think it's yeah. so usable now because and this is this is why it literally destroys brain cells is because people mix it with cleaning supplies like comic cleanser uh, or yeah really? there's 
crystal meth has a whole lot of stuff in it. Wow. It's not, you know, back in the day when Coke was readily available in the eighties and, and you would smoke crack, it was basically pure cocaine. Now right. it's cut with so many other things. And then you add fentanyl to the equation, yeah. which people are right. cutting things with where it literally kills you. Um, it's just, it's just a scary proposition. Well, I, I, so I can see, you know, a, Again, depending on your status in life or whatever, the crystal meth. But there are wealthy gay men who are addicted to um, prescription drugs because they've got the money to be able to get the stuff, you know, or to get more expensive drugs and to hide that. Um, you have a back issue. You know, you've had back surgery since you were younger. Because of your background coming from family, you know, parents that were um, addic addicts, did you find yourself maybe falling prey to, you know, the muscle relaxants or, or the drugs that you had gotten after your surgeries? No, I hate, hate um, taking prescription drugs. Oh, and, okay. Um, I take them when they're absolutely necessary. Like, you know, my back went out a couple of weeks ago. Um, yeah. And the pain is so severe that I have to ride. I have to in those instances. But as soon as I'm able to tolerate it, and again, it's been since I was 17. So I've learned to live with pain on a certain level. Um, that to me, and I also dealt with my addiction issues in my 20s. Right. So I'm hyper aware of it. And right. I sometimes will go, and I've had doctors say this to me, that you've gone too long. You know, you have to, because it, it puts stress on the rest of my body. Sure. You know, the, the pain does a lot to you physically. So uh, I abs the pendulum swings the other way for me where I will put it off as long as humanly possible. Um, and so to me, that's not a, not a big monkey on my back. Um, the, right. But can you see how people do get addicted after having oh, surgeries without a doubt. or whatever? If the doctor's yeah. prescribing it, then it's okay, right? right? That was yeah. my mother. My God, yeah. Valium and painkillers, the woman lived on, you know, and it's because the doctor was giving it to her. It has to be okay. It's acceptable. Back in the 70s, you know, when we were younger, and I, I grew up in a very affluent um, area, that was like the housewife helper, you know, yeah. Valium. I mean, like everyone's like popping their whatever's just... It's like crazy. And, you know, they could hide it better. They they weren't smoking crystal meth down in the streets with each yeah. other. They were getting these prescriptions. Um, because and it was they could alcohol too, it. right? Because oh, that's what yeah. you did. It was a cocktail party. So I have oh, a bottle my God. of vodka. <laughs> when I think back, like my grandparents, um, every night, they, they were the people that got dressed for dinner. But they would have like cocktails before dinner every night yeah. and i thought that was like so chic and whatever but then you know as i got older i'm like oh i think someone had a little drinking problem you know yeah, yeah. Um, when you have eight or nine cocktails before dinner that's yeah a problem. well who knows how many they were having but just the fact that every night before dinner they would go into you know and have cocktails um i would imagine that's also somewhere that it starts um but like I said, it affects everybody, no matter where you are in life, no matter where you live, no matter where you're from. So many reasons why filling a void, genetically being vulnerable to it because it's in your DNA, carrying so much shame in life. There are so many reasons why we all are becoming addicted. Um, I know I smoked cigarettes throughout my 20s and into that still my 30s. boggles my mind <laughs> every time I, you say that it shocks the crap out of me i loved smoking wow. i first of all i was so thin uh but i just loved the whole thing the smoking and the blowing the smoke i felt i looked so cool and um but i know i was totally addicted to smoking smoking is very addictive yeah nicotine is is probably one of the worst addictive. so i also kind of there. feel like I have that addictive part of me. Um, luckily, I, I don't really like drinking. I don't like feeling weird. Uh, you know, I'm such a freaking lightweight too. Like one drink and I'm on the table. <laughs> Let's go. So I know when to stop. But yeah, I think we all have a, a little bit of that addictive part of us that we have to be really 
careful about. So we've discussed a bunch of the different addictions that gay men our age and older are are experiencing. We've also kind of talked about why this is happening and so much of us is our uh, so much of it is our inner shame or or trying to fill voids or genetically we're predisposed to it. So I think the next question that we need to ask is is this something that we can move on from or is this something that is just going to hang on with all of us as we're aging? I don't think there's anything we can ever not move on from. That was a double negative, I know. <laughs> no, no, it was <laughs> good, though. It made sense. There's, there, I don't think there's any age where you can just go, oh, I give up, I'm too old. Because if you want to, you can. And I, I, I just think it takes that moment of realization that you deserve better in life. And for me, that's what it came down to, is... I had this amazing person in my life who, it's so hard for me to talk about this without getting emotional, who believed I was better than what I thought I was. Right. And that made all the difference. It is so important to have somebody there to believe in you. But as we've seen from a lot of the guys who are watching and listening to us, a lot of guys are out there alone. Yeah. They have lost a lot of their their friend circles, their family, their partners, or they are just isolated wherever they're living, which is another reason why people turn to addiction, isolation. So it is really important to have somebody to say to you, I believe in you, you're enough. Um, let's try to get control of this. But that takes a lot of guts to be able to step up and say that to a friend. Um, Yes, if it was my husband, sure, I would be able to say it to him. But but being able to step up and say something that personal, that invasive to someone who's just a friend, that's a, that takes a lot of balls, right? Um, I think there are ways of saying it because I've done this in the past um, where it's like, if you need me, I'm here. I just want you to know that. Right. Because I understand something's going on and... I'm willing to listen, can make the difference, a huge difference in somebody else's life. But then again, though, if all of us are in this world of shame, then admitting that to a friend is even more shameful or makes us feel more shameful. The, the interesting thing that you just said there, we're all there, right? Yeah. So the moment you share it with somebody else and you get that feeling of connection when they say, oh my God, I've experienced that too that all of a sudden it feels a little bit lighter. That's, that's the gift of conversation and opening up and sharing, is that it makes you feel a little bit lighter, and it also makes the person who you're talking to feel a little bit more connected to you. And I think from our generation, that's a thing we didn't do, and right. I feel like the more we talk to each other about stuff like this, the more we will realize other people have been there, gone through it, or are going through it, and it helps lessen the shame or the fear that we're feeling. Because it's like, oh my God, we're, we're literally in the same boat. Right. So why not try to paddle together, right? As opposed to just going around in a circle with one oar. All right. Well, I'm going to throw something back at you, though. Uh you said your back went out. Uh, when your back does go out, you will lie on the floor at home by yourself without telling anybody that you need some help. Correct? Half correct. I do lie on the floor by myself because the pain is excruciating and it's best right. for me to, to be alone and weather that. But I text people and if I need, then you, know, people, you have the keys to my place. Um, that someone has the ability to get to me. And it's right, funny because but... this particular time around, my back went out while I was in LA. <laughs> right. And um, I, my stubborn self, got in my truck and tried to drive back to Palm Springs because I know I have a small window before it goes in the full spasm and yeah. I can't even stand up. Um, and I thought I might be able to <laughs> squeak by. And I literally got two blocks. And I had to call our friend Joe and say, I can't 
drive. Um, right. And I made it but, to his house and I lied on their floor for four days. Well, there you go. But the thing is that you at first were like, nope, I'm not, I don't need any help. I'm going to do this on my own. I don't care how painful it is. And that's just a back problem. Imagine if you are filled with so much shame because you are in this spiral of addiction. If you won't call someone initially because of your back, I mean, I, I, I think it's really hard for people to say, like, I need help. Oh, it's, it's probably Especially the hardest with thing. with an addiction. Yeah, it's probably the hardest yeah. thing anyone with an addiction will ever do. Yeah. And I think those are the things we have to push through. Because again, in my 20s, I dealt with this, where it was for the first time. Right. I spoke the words out loud. I hate myself. I have a problem. I need help because I can't do this anymore. And my life changed. So I think when you dealt with your issue, you were in your 20s. And when we're young and 20, we have a lot more energy and a lot more bandwidth to be able to deal with problems like this. But when you get into your 60s and 70s or even 80s, the struggle to be able to overcome an addiction takes a lot. And I think by that time in your you know, age-wise, we're like, I just don't have it in me. I'm tired. I don't want to, I can't fight this. I'm just going to die this way. See, I, I definitely believe that there are people out there who feel that way. But yes. I, in, in hindsight, I look at it and I go, wow, you know, in my 20s, I was really stupid on a lot of levels. I didn't know, and I'm not saying stupid in a negative term. It was just, there was a lot I didn't know. And as I, as we get older, I think we, some of us may have the ability to deal with things on a different level than we did when we were 20. And so to have the realization that, oh, you know what, I can overcome this in my 60s, should hopefully be in some people's minds that it's not. Well, yeah, of course it's in some people's minds, but I'm just saying that there are a lot of people, older people like us, who are like, I don't have it in me to fight this anymore. I don't have the energy because I can hardly even, you know, get through my day. So I don't have the energy to fight. That's all I'm saying, that there are some people out there who just don't have it in them to fight or yeah. to admit to the problem. I think for any sort of problem in our lives, admitting the problem is the biggest step that we can do. Uh, but I do want to throw this out there. If you're still here and you've gone through the shit that we've gone through, you've obviously fought to get to where you are. It may not be the greatest place on earth. It may be unhappy a lot of the time, but you still have fight in you if you're still here. You know, um, when my back did go out, I I'm just so tired of pain sometimes that it's not even funny. And I have to be honest, the thought of swallowing a bottle of muscle relaxers and just going to sleep sometimes is an attractive thought. But then something takes over because I'm like, you know what? I've made it this far and it's not going to fucking beat me. And right. I, but I, Michael, I would, that's you. That's you. And you have I'm, that fight in you. Some people totally. don't. Some people, right. So th and, that's all I'm saying is yeah. that we have to agree that some people are like you and other people are not like you. But again, my and, point is if they're still here, they have some fight in them. They may not be able to acknowledge it in this particular moment, but if you're still here, you got some fight left in you. That's my point. Maybe. Some people don't. Some people have given up. We, we've gotten a lot of letters from guys, especially, you know, when we were talking about relationships and uh, other topics, they're like, yeah, I, I've just given up. A lot of people out there have given up. Um, I don't want people to give up. I want them to, as you said, fight and move forward. But I just think we have to acknowledge that there are men in our gay community who have given up the fight. Um, and so what are things that we can do to help all of these people out there? You know. Biggest thing is get some help. If you don't want to talk to your yeah. friends, find somebody. We are in such a great age that you all you have to do is go on your computer, on your phone, Google, I need some help with addiction. Especially, you know, a lot of a, a lot of reasons why gay men don't seek help is because they don't want to have to go to a therapist who doesn't get them. But now you can talk to a gay therapist online. You can 
go to a gay support group online. That that certainly helps. You yeah, know? it doesn't matter where you are because you could you know you could make contact with a group in Los Angeles if you're in you know. Oh, definitely. Walla Walla, Washington, or wherever you know. Um, but I just I, I need to go back for one second. Um, those people who are reaching out to us, telling that they telling us that they have given up, is a way of reaching out. To me, it's it's a sign that they haven't completely given up. That if if they're sharing stories with us, that there is still some hope in there, and that's that's all I'm. I want to point to in all of us. If we're still here, we fought a lot. There's still got to be some sense of hope, some little little spark that still exists. And that's what I feel those letters of people who reach out to us are more about, who do say, I've given up. If indeed they did give up, they wouldn't even bother writing. Um, so I try to look at that positive, um, that they have reached out. You know, that's, that's just right. me. Maybe I'm being Pollyannish. And no, thinking, not at all. I mean, that's why we're doing this. We want to, to kind of break out of this secret thing and say, yeah, our community is having a problem with addiction. We're not here to solve your problems, but we want to start talking yeah. about it. If you see somebody, if you have a friend who you see is suffering, speak up, say something, Please. help them out. Say like, you know what? I might not understand what you're going through, but I'm here for you, whatever you need. Do you want me to call somebody? Do you want to talk to me? Whatever it is. I think mean, that's what we need to do is, yes, have that hope. Clutch onto that hope. Whatever age you are, if you're 80 or 90 and you're a gay male who still is swallowed or uh, Consumed whatever. Consumed by grief or hurt. Yes, or shame. Yeah. You know, whatever the problem is. We need to be there for each other. That's the thing. We are a community. And stop turning your eye, you know, to what's happening. And let's help each other. You know, we have been through a lot. We have fought a ton. So let's keep fighting to make sure that we are as healthy and happy and fulfilled as possible. Uh, stop this kind of addiction spiral. Because the support system is vital. And even if you do feel alone and separate, like Tom said, there are support groups. Regardless of where you are in this country, if you have access to the internet and you're able to watch us, you're able to reach out to an LGBTQ community center right. and have access to support. They are there for you. And right. it's, it, it, it's hard to reach out. It's hard, it's hard man. But... Um, you know, it, it's what's the alternative? So the big answer to the question, can we move beyond this or is it too late? No, we can move beyond this, but we have to do it together. We have to acknowledge that we have a problem or acknowledge that people we know have problems and to be there for each other and to support each other and move forward and try to get out of this addictive spiral that we're in, whatever it is. So like I said in the very beginning, we're not doctors, we're not therapists, we are not seriously intelligent enough to talk about anything in life. But we are, we do want to have this conversation. We want to start it and we want to hear from all of you people out there as well. Like, what are your thoughts on addiction? How have you battled your demons? Um, what would you do if a friend of yours had an addiction? Let us know. How can people get in touch with us, Michael? You guys could find us across social media at the moniker No Two Gays About It, and that includes Facebook, Instagram, uh, TikTok, and you could also send us an email at no two gays about it at gmail.com. And we're also on Patreon. And if you guys feel so moved, please hop over to Patreon or YouTube and become a contributor to our show because it helps us continue to have conversations like the one we had today. Regardless of how hard it is, we want to keep talking about this stuff and we need your help and support. And we'd also like to thank Ted Zalewski, Cesar Montero, and David Tiley for being contributors to us on Patreon at our executive producer role. Guys, we appreciate you so much. Thank you. 
Yeah, guys, thanks so much. We really do appreciate your support of our show. And we we really appreciate all of you guys out there who are watching and listening to us. Make sure that you do leave us a comment. Let us know that what we are talking about is important to you. Or let us know what subjects you might like us to tackle. All right. Well, that does it for today, Michael. This was a little bit of a tough conversation talking about addiction because that does, as I said, affects everyone who's yeah. out there. And it is really devastating to our over 50 gay population. So thank you, Michael, for cheer for sharing all of your thoughts and also your personal stories. That was awesome. Um, so you know what? Until next time, Michael. Until next time, Tom. Thank you guys for listening. Hey, thanks so much for watching. And don't forget to subscribe. And if you like what you saw, check out some of our other videos.